Dr. Michelle Warren is here now talking about hypothalamic amenorrhea, and I know you have worked very hard on the task force on these new guidelines. So can you talk to us about what is in this new guideline? So the new guidelines address the difficulty in making the diagnosis. Uh, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, because women rep, uh, appear with uh, lack of periods, one has to go through all the differential diagnosis of uh, things that cause lack of periods. And it's fairly extensive, uh, both in the uh, adolescent and the adult. And once that's been eliminated, uh, it's an issue of, of uh, pinpointing uh, exactly what the hypothalamic amenorrhea is due to. And there are usually three things. One is um, weight loss, uh, another is overexercise, and uh, the third is uh, stress, or a combination of, of the three. It's usually a combination of the three. When we're dealing with young women, losing weight and stress in their lives is pretty right. prevalent. So it sounds like the questions that the clinician asks can be really critical in making the diagnosis. Yes, that's true. The, the questions are really critical because um, you have to ask if they're following a pattern of uh, exercise that's excessive. It, it's not normally part of our workup. We usually ask patients, are they exercising and happy when they are? So. Um, the amount of exercise they're doing. Also, uh, athletes, particularly competitive athletes, tend to develop this problem um, in certain cases. And um, the stress is difficult to evaluate, very difficult to evaluate. So, and we look for weight loss. And we look for a history of eating disorders as well. Um, so, and I tend to ask a little bit about the diet because there are certain diets, although we may think of them as healthy, some, of, some people use them to lose weight. For instance, vegetarianism in certain cases, uh, women are following inadequate uh, vegetarian diets and uh, not eating enough. So what we're looking for specifically are, um, is uh, damage to the signal of GnRH secretion. And the GnRH uh, uh, secretion, which affects LH and FSH pulsatility, is decreased and uh, that shuts down the reproductive system. So let's talk about the treatments because there are some new guidelines and new recommendations for treatment as well. Yes, I think the most important thing about the guidelines is really the treatments because there's been a whole lot of research recently suggesting that behavioral intervention is the most important intervention. And although it's been well known, mainstream has not followed uh, the uh, instructions now, behavior, intervening with behavior is very difficult. Um, basically, you have to tell uh, patients to decrease their exercise or gain weight or uh, uh, receive treatment for uh, stress, which involves sometimes uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with the stress. Patients are very resistant to that. They're, they think they are, are healthy because they're exercising and they like being thin. Um, and in some cases, we deal with eating disorders, which lead to the same thing. So uh, it's a very difficult uh, intervention. Um, the other thing is we're not recommending oral contraceptives. Um, we now feel that oral contraceptives are um, maybe suppressing some things that are important that we want to have recover, such as IGF-1. Um, so. Uh, we do recommend that uh, you try transdermal, preferably transdermal estrogen after six months of intervention, if intervention hasn't worked. So I think that's the most important uh, takeaway, that you really can't use oral contraceptives to mask this syndrome, and that you have to try behavioral first and then uh, transdermal estrogen. Those changes seem a very big reason why clinicians should adopt these new guidelines, but why else do you think it is so critical? Um, it's critical mainly because um, these individuals will have permanent per bone loss if something isn't done. And um, also there's an effect on reproduction. Obviously, if you're not having periods, um, you can't uh, conceive. So um, it's uh, very important to address the issues, prevent permanent health problems, and uh, help patients become pregnant without having to go through uh, a draining uh, infertility treatment with injections and IVF. Uh, and educating clinicians really goes 
two steps forward to educating the public about this and making yes. it easier to treat overall? Well, I think the public is going to be very helpful because you can refer patients to the guidelines if they want to. I've had a patient who came in and said, oh, I hear the intervention is behavioral. And it made it so much easier to uh, address the issues because patients are resistant to that. They don't want to gain weight and they don't want to change their habits and they think they look great and uh, they like uh, what they're eating. The other thing is we also don't recommend that uh, you try to conceive if your BMI is less than 18.5 um, because there's a higher incidence of miscarriage, uh, small babies, and uh, retarded fetal growth. So we feel that um, the um, medical communities should encourage women to gain weight before they try to conceive. Well, thanks for all your hard work on this. It sounds like this education process is really going to help everyone. I hope so. Thanks, everyone.